Okay, I'm going to, uh, I told you I'm going to talk about uh, reasonable disclosure uh, and lessons that I learned from this whole Cisco Gate lawsuit. But for today, I want to try a new presentation style. I've tried it actually once before, so it's not totally new. Um, and it's a style I stole basically from the presentationzen.com website. Um, they have several different ideas on how you should present information, and I'm going to try one of them. And uh, I'm going for the Yoda versus Darth Vader model. So, um, for example, in the Yoda model, you see that Yoda's out front. Uh, he's not blocking the screen. The screen has very little information on it. It's very clear to understand. Um, and he looks kind of serene. Looks like he knows what he's about to talk about. And then uh, on the other hand, we've got the Darth Vader model. And uh, Darth is just overwhelming you with information. He just wants to let you know everything all at once. Um, you know, from bringing order to the galaxy, I love the best part at the bottom. You know, for, for more information, please see my website at... <laughs> He's just trying to get to you all at once. He's blocking the view. The text isn't very easy to read. He's uh, got way too many bullet points. So I'm thinking, well, that's the force versus the dark side. What can that really be like? But then we've got Steve Jobs versus Bill G. Steve's up here. He's all slick. He's got you focused on the key points. There's a chip or there's a disk. There's OS 9 or there's OS X. Very straightforward. He's off to the side. You want to guess what's on the next slide? You got Bill. <laughs> Bill's trying to explain his whole product life cycle to you. He's engaging. He's blocking. You can't even, you can spend 10 minutes and not even understand what's going on with that slide. And you know somebody got paid about $15,000 to build that thing. So I'm going to try to be Yoda. That's my whole goal. Now, I am not Yoda, um, but I have been in the presence of Yoda. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if you know who uh, Robert Morris Sr. is, but uh, he's sort of like the grandfather of crypto in the, uh, in the, at the NSA. And uh, if you look at his Wikipedia site, you can see he basically did everything. And uh, his son also invented the first internet worm, Robert Morris Jr. So I'm hoping that by standing next to him, I've osmotically uh, learned some information that I can pass on to you today. So my plan then is to offer some insight uh, into the self-interest of people who are involved in the disclosure debate. And then I'm going to illustrate some of those differences with my war story here. Uh, and then to be sort of interactive throughout the war story, every time I had a sort of a critical decision point, I'm going to let you know what it was. And then I want to see by a show of hands if you guys would have made sort of the same decision I made, or would you have made a uh, a different decision. So uh, in the context of this talk, uh, who am I? Well, let me see. When I was uh, 13, I had this IBM PC2 dual double-sided disk drives, Epson FX80 printer, and I quickly took it apart, tried to overclock it, and then I found one of these at Boeing Surplus in Seattle. So I hooked it up to a little it's 110 baud, and then later on I got a 300 baud acoustic coupler modem. And I still remember the first underground hacking bulletin board I dialed. 244-6252 is the phone number. I can't ever forget it. Then I watched this movie, War Games, and, uh, and it was game over. I got addicted uh, really early on. And the uh, interesting thing is uh, some of the friends I met who also had seen War Games were really complaining about it. They said, this sucks. Now everybody knows about war dialing. The secret is out. Everybody is going to lock up their modem pools. They're going to assign passwords. We're not going to be able to hack anymore since this movie came out. And uh, yeah, that was 20 years ago. And hacking has not slowed down. So let's see. I ended up going to uh, college. College was good. Went to Gonzaga. Then I uh, went to law school. And I ended up dropping out because uh, I did not like law school. It's not very, uh, does not appeal to me. So instead, in 1993, I started DEF CON. That's pretty much everybody who was at DEF CON. Um, there's some notables here. Let's see, there's the Jackal, there's Dune, uh, Noid, there's LF1 who started or took over Bug Track, and there's me wedged into that car. And then I started a business which promptly failed. Uh, it was a web integration business. Uh, Back then, the only people paying for selling things online were porn companies, and they don't normally pay their bills on time. 
So I went to work for the man at Ernst and Young, and uh, and then I started the professional services group over at Secure Computing, which later became uh, Gardent. And then in uh, '97, I started the Black Hat Briefings, which I sold in 2005 to uh, a media company called CMP. And because I now no longer work for myself, I get a boss. And that's my boss, and that's me, and that's my beer. So life is pretty good with my boss. He's uh, easy to get along with. Now let's see, a word about disclosure. Let's start this up. I thought this was sort of a self-evident topic that had been dead like for a decade. Every time this topic comes up, I get a little frustrated because I get this deja vu feeling like, haven't we been here before? Why do we keep talking about this stuff? It will not go away. And part of me thinks it's because it's an interesting topic that people who are new to security get all excited about. It's like some moral dilemma that they can wrap their head around and they get all excited. And, uh, and it's been nicely summarized for years and years and years. Um, and this is like a very small sampling of the hundreds and hundreds of people who've done talks and uh, presentations on it, looking at it from different angles. Um, but no matter what, this topic is like not dying. It's people just keep talking about it. So I'm going to talk about it a little bit more, but I want to throw in my own little version of it. And uh, let me just quickly define some of our models before we get going. There's the full disclosure model, which is sort of uh, typified by full disclosure mailing list, which is you just reveal everything. Uh, don't hold back any of the zero day details. Uh, release uh, exploit code. And this is sort of uh, favored by researchers, enthusiasts, nonprofits, um, people who don't really have anything to lose and everything to gain. Uh, then you have sort of responsible disclosure, which is, I would say, sort of the bug check model. Uh, vendors, conferences, quote unquote professionals, um, they want to get the credit for inventing something cool, but they don't want any of the risks. It's sort of like they're walking. They want the best of both worlds. Uh, limited disclosure with no specifics, I think that's what Microsoft and every vendor in the world would prefer. There is a bug, patch your stuff and then they don't give you any details. And then there's zero disclosure, which is sort of like Dave up here in the front. Raise your hand, Dave. Yay. I like the zero disclosure model because it's so simple. Um, you just don't say anything. Notice how it's typified by uh, busy researchers and criminals down there. You like that? That's good. Um, and then here are some of your uh, ideologies. Um, and I stole this slide from The Politics of Vulnerabilities by Scott Blake. It was the coolest slide he had, so I took it. And uh, you can see the people who adhere to this. I live in this middle world. I live in the responsible disclosure world as a conference kind of guy. So this is where I'm going to focus. This is what I, I try to uh, adhere to. Um, I love people to release vulnerability details. If they release exploits, that's fine too, as long as they've notified the vendors. If they haven't notified the vendors and they release zero day, um, I'm not gonna cry about it, but as a professional, it's probably the responsible thing to do is give the vendor a heads up. You can, and this is where all the argument comes from. Um, how much of a heads up do you give the vendor? Do you give them a day, a week? Um, you know, if you're going to speak at Black Hat and you have some zero day and you want to tell the vendor about it, do you tell them an hour ahead of time? Or you tell Apple ahead of time, you know, on the phone, sort of like David Mayner? Or do you uh, give them weeks and weeks and weeks? So you start arguing about what is reasonable. Um, and everybody pretty much agrees that one day of notice is not reasonable, a hundred days is also not reasonable. In between, I think it's pretty much anybody can argue what is reasonable. So when I was looking for uh, a story I could tell to illustrate some of these points, I was thinking, well, what have I been near? I've been sort of kind of close to Dmitry Skylarov, uh, Mike Lynn, uh, David Maynard, uh, Chris Paget, IOActive thing with uh, RFID reader and HID. And uh, I, had to pick, I had to pick a war story, right? What am I going to pick? Elcom, Cisco, Apple, HID? I think Cisco illustrates everything perfectly because not only was I involved in it, I, was, I could see what was happening on every other front. I could see what was happening to Mike. I could hear Mike's uh, attorney talking to Mike. I could see everything that was going on. And I was there from the very beginning. So I'm going to now get in 
to the guts of the talk, which is the story here. I'm going to introduce the players. We've got Black Hat. This is at 2005. Um, I had some pretty clear-cut goals in 2005. This was the year I was trying to sell my business. I've been trying to sell Black Hat for a number of years. And this year, I finally had some people there who were maybe going to give me some money. So I was pretty excited. I had like six companies there that might buy Black Hat. And uh, so I needed to have a great conference. And at the point in time, it was the largest one I'd ever done. And uh, I have a tradition of gambling $20 in quarters every year. And I either walk away with more money or I walk away with no money. And I always drink a beer. So my goals are very clear cut. I'm going to use this next slide to illustrate all the decision points that happen along the way. Sort of a timeline on the left, actions on the right. And uh, we'll start off at the very beginning. Mike Lynn uh, submits a talk. He calls the holy grail Cisco IOS cell code and remote execution. So that's a pretty provocative title. Uh, this is basically his submission email he sends in. And uh, you can see, I don't know how well you can see, I think I, uh, I didn't highlight it very easily. If you look at this, look at the reasons at the bottom. What are the three most important reasons why this is a quality black hat talk? Uh, it's never been done before. Sure, FX came close, but I'm talking about reliable, repeatable remote execution of arbitrary code. Uh, playing with critical infrastructure is exciting. And uh, reason three, iOS shell code, iOS backdoors, the end of the world, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> so who would accept this talk? Do you accept this talk? Yes. You would be an idiot to not accept this talk. And uh, in accepting the talk, there's this title called Transfer of Copyright. And uh, there's, uh, everybody has to sign this. It's basically that we, as Black Hat, have permission to produce conference CDs and post your slides on the web and not get sued by you or your company. So there are these two critical little sentences here. Uh, that you've obtained permission to give Black Hat permission to publish materials. And Black Hat has permissions to duplicate, record, redistribute, do whatever we want with this stuff. Um, that seems pretty clear, doesn't it? And since Mike was working for ISS, uh, he had to have buy-off by his uh, managers and uh, PR before he could submit the talk. So this was all agreed to before his uh, presentation even uh, arrived. So, so this happens in late February 2005. We already decided that we accept it. We'd be an idiot not to accept this. So now we've got Mike. Mike and Black Hat. Everything's good. Planning for the conference. Early June comes along. We get a call from one of Mike's friends at ISS. Just wondering, hey, is it OK if Mike uh, could change some of his slide materials? Is that OK? Could we update a slide or two? Um, which is kind of strange, because normally, uh, normally the speaker is the person who asks to see if materials could be changed. So uh, let me see. We tell them it's OK. You can change materials at any time up to the print deadline. And why is it not advancing? Please advance. Oh, yes. I'll destroy you. So we've got four months uh, that go by. And this thing is not presenting anymore. Oh, damn it. There we go. So, yes, you can change the materials up until the print deadline. No big deal. Now it's late June. Now we're getting close to the print deadline. Um, we've got books to produce, CDs to produce. And we get a second call from Mike's friend, who shall remain nameless, um, wondering, what would it take to change the materials? Can we still change material materials? And what would it take? Um, and so we sort of assumed Mike was being lazy, or Mike had just talked to his friend, because his friend was on a first name basis, and just kind of wondering what could happen if, uh, if it could still be changed. And, uh, and we're saying, yeah, you can still change, but it's getting pretty, it's getting pretty late. Um, so we have to find out. We find out what the print deadlines are. And, uh, and we find out that it costs the same amount of money. We can change all the slide material. It won't cost us a dime more. We can do it right now. If you turn in the materials and pull the slide stuff, we can do it this second. No big deal. Then we get this email, uh, priority, urgent from Renee Wagner. Um, the key players here are, you've got Carl Bernson, 
who sells all of our sponsorships. And they are revising, ISS is revising the abstract copy of Mike Lynn's Cisco iOS presentation. They want to revise his materials on our website and would like to ask us to remove the previous content and post the new content. This is not coming from Mike, this is coming from Renee. So, that's a little weird. Because we accepted Mike, we didn't accept ISS. So, do you update the materials at the behest of Renee over at ISS? Raise your hand, who would update the materials? Dave would update the materials. Um, I think we should update the materials if Mike says it's okay to update the materials. So we go ahead and we ask Mike, like, what's going on? Should we update the materials or not? And Mike's pretty easy going. You can see as he's rocking out here. But now we've got ISS involved. ISS is trying to get in on Mike's action. So now I've got two people talking to me. So now I've got to get involved because something is hideously going wrong here and I hate it when uh, employers start trying to mess around with their employees' submissions. So we talk to Mike. Mike says everything's cool. I don't care, you can do whatever you want to my materials online as long as I get to present my materials. I'll remove a couple of details, key uh, offsets and some other source code snippets, um, and it'll please ISS because really what we're tr ISS is trying to do is please Cisco and that'll become a little bit more clear later. Um, Mike and ISS know it's still possible to update the materials, and as long as he plans to do his demo and show that it happens, he doesn't care. That's the most important thing. He needs to show his, uh, his demo. So, it's a little weird, but it's not costing me any more money, and it's, uh, there's still time to do it, so I'll roll with the punches and uh, make any changes that they want. But then the threats begin. This is also from Renee. I edited it down so you could get it all on one screen. Ping is the person that was maintaining the website back then. So apparently now they want to reprint all the materials at a cost to Cisco, including rush fees. Um, and if it's not possible to fulfill this request, they're going to cancel all their sponsorships, pull all their attendees, and generally be bad players. Please call me as soon as possible. Um, so it went from everything's okay to these threats about uh, Cisco uh, paying for everything. So I'm a little frustrated. I'm like, what the fuck? Like, like you're a sponsor, everything's cool, but now we've got Cisco involved. So Cisco's pressuring ISS, which is pressuring me, it's pressuring Mike. Um, it's quickly kind of getting out of hand. And since now they're threatening me, I do what any good American does. You involve your lawyer. So now I've got my lawyer in the mix. So we've got, you know, Team Black Hat on the left, and we've got these other players here uh, kind of in the middle. And uh, so with these threats involved, they're basically telling us reprint all the printed materials in the CD and that, I, I, uh, that Cisco wants to have it all done. It's all coming from Cisco, it's not us. Um, and they threaten sponsorship. So you know what the question is. Do you do it? Do you reprint? Or do you tell them to take a flying leap? They're going to pay for it. It doesn't cost you a thing. Who here would reprint? And who wouldn't reprint? Why wouldn't you reprint? It doesn't cost you a thing. The principle is that you're, just, you're too busy and you, know, you don't want to afford an updated PDF to the printer. Um, so, so I'm not opposed to reprinting. But reprinting uh, is expensive, and it's time consuming. At some point, it actually becomes physically impossible to reprint. Um, we got that email, if you, I'm sorry, if you notice this, uh, the previous email, we got it um, two days before uh, the conference re uh, training started. So we're in Las Vegas, uh, and it's a little bit hard to reprint, so Ping, uh, crafted this beautiful email, basically saying, Renee, I believe that ISS does not uh, understand that the following items would need to be reprinted. The printed conference proceedings book that contains all the materials. It contains his old descriptions, his old title, and the slides. The conference CD, which contains a PDF, and the printed program, which contains all the, the description in the old title. Um, 
It is absolutely impossible for each one of these items to be revised, reprinted, and delivered here in time on Monday, July 25th AM for the conference. The conference proceedings are well over 1,100 pages and require a week to produce, another week to ship, and weighs 2,300, uh, I mean, sorry, 14,000 pounds. Uh, and is 2,300 books. Uh, rush production is possible, but you get to pay 100% rush charge. And since you'd be producing on a weekend, that's another 100% rush charge. So it gets fantastically expensive. Um, and at the very bottom, it just says, I've received a request from Mike Lynn and will update the web page. But it's basically impossible. Um, we called around in the surrounding states, Nevada, California, Oregon. You can't produce these books. It cannot, physically cannot be done in time. And they dithered and dithered, and now it, they've run out of time. And so far, you'll notice, I haven't heard word one from anybody at uh, Cisco. So as far as I know, we told them it's not possible. We get this email back from Renee on Friday the 22nd that says, I sincerely appreciate you taking the time to outline the specific challenges. I wish you best of luck. Sounds like the problem's over. We told them that we couldn't produce the materials in time, and they said, okay, I thought it would be a problem. Best of luck. Who here thinks everything's okay? <laughs> I mean, this is a great email. It's like, great, I can focus on the conference. Everything's good. Um, yeah. So uh, there's a significant undertaking, wishes us best of luck. We all say, great, that problem's done, and we move on. Well, if only. I'm hanging down at the conference, and I run into this guy, Mike Cottle from Cisco. And uh, it's 40, out, 40 hours to go to the briefings, and uh, I'm just hanging around calming my nerves. Mike comes up to me and says, hey, Jeff, I, uh, mind if I uh, see the presentation materials? I say, oh, hey, Mike, I know you're, uh, you're from Cisco. You probably want to see Mike Lynn's talk. He's like, yeah, yeah, I'm kind of interested. I'm like, okay. Um, well, we don't normally hand out the books until, like, maybe the evening right before. He's like, well, I'd really like to see it, you know. He says, well, if I give you the book, um, don't say you got it from me, and uh, just look it over and then give it back to me, because I don't want everybody coming up to me wanting their books early. He's like, no problem. So um, the question is, do you, well, I'm, I'm sorry, I jumped a little bit ahead. Do you let him see the materials? Uh, and uh, who would let him see the materials? You would let him, let him see the materials, show of hands? OK, not let him see the materials. See, now, why wouldn't you let him see the materials? Renee's told me everything's cool. <coughs> Anybody from the, the against camp? Because <laughs> I <laughs> well, I had the everything's okay from Renee in writing. Um, wait, so so you show him? Yes, I do show him because I, I understand at that point that everything's okay. Um, ISS said everything's okay. And Mike's a good guy, and what's he really going to do? So he flips open the book, goes to Mike's materials, and the first thing he says is, holy crap, that's not supposed to be in there. At which point I say, what's, what's not supposed to be in there? And he's like, ISS told us that none of these materials were in the book. I'm like, well, they're in the book. Guess what? You know? Um, <laughs> and he's like, I've got to make some phone calls. Like, you make what any phone calls you got to make. Um, you do your thing. So he, uh, he starts making phone calls, and like literally uh, within 10 seconds of making phone calls, we start getting scary lawyer calls. Um, and there's scary lawyer calls from the Cisco. And so they're, I looked at the market cap that day. They're like $6 billion or $10 billion or $15 billion. And I look at my market cap, which is like checking my bank account. And you realize there's some trouble here. Um, my biggest conference ever is running. I've got prospective buyers like all over the place. ISS didn't bother telling Cisco that reprinting was ever an option. And ISS told Cisco that the materials weren't in there. Um, so now I've got not just one billion dollar company, I've got two billion dollar companies breathing down my back. And ISS changes their story and tells Cisco that I had told them that everything was fine and everything had been taken care of. So I've got some problems. 
They want me to remove the materials. Um, Cisco says that um, it's too late to replace the materials. It's too late to reproduce. So the only option is to pull the materials. And uh, it's not too late to do that. Now, they've got, these judge they've got uh, lawyers on the phone. They're threatening all kind of imminent harm. And that's like the magic uh, term of art uh, uh, legal phrase, imminent harm, meaning that they can't delay. Damage will occur immediately, so they have to take action. And since Cisco is really big and they're friends with Judge White, or no Judge White, in, uh, in California, and they make their case to this federal judge, or they're trying to make a case to a federal judge, that um, uh, if they don't have this material pulled, the internet will crash, you know, intellectual property will be leaked, and imminent harm will occur. So from our standpoint, if you, if you risk, if you go, if you challenge them, and if you risk uh, battling them and not pulling the materials, and you lose, and the judge buys imminent harm, and he shuts down your conference, you've got like 3,000 people now without a show to go to. that have paid money to fly to your conference and pay for hotel rooms, and they can't go to your conference because you're shut down. And that's kind of a big risk. Um, and it's not my material, and if the speaker wants me to pull the material, I would just seriously contemplate removing the material because I'm not going to try to get him in trouble by publishing it, and I certainly don't want my conference shut down. So I'm kind of in a rock and a hard place. So um, the question is, would you remove? Would you remove the material and risk the future of the conference, or would you tough it out on principle and let the lawyers go at it? Who would remove? Who would tough it out? OK. So. Um, Luckily for me, that question was, uh, was removed when the judge issued a temporary restraining order, and the judge, federal judge ordered us to remove. So I didn't have to make that decision. Um, I was all for removal, though, if Mike Lynn was OK with it. So we had to remove. And now we've got a problem of how do you remove all this material quickly? Um, luckily, Cisco was there with like 15, 20 people. They hired temporary employees. They. Uh, <laughs> They like, Mike Cottle hits this magic button on his pager. I seriously, it's like he hits one magic button and like every Cisco pager goes off in all of Caesar's palace. And people are down at the bar having drinks and all of a sudden they're told like, time to rip out pages. So I have this video I'll play you later of, uh, of everybody ripping out all the pages. It was pretty impressive. They did uh, 2,300 books in like four hours. It was pretty fast. So they pull out all the pages. The materials removed from the conference book. Uh, Cisco and ISS decided they would, they would pay for, they'd reburn the CDs on their own gear. They'd ship in the CDs so we could hand something out. Um, and we updated the Black Hat website to remove uh, Mike's materials. So we've uh, complied with the federal uh, TRO. And we think everything is cool at this point. Um, it is not. Um, Let's see, where are we? We've got the scary lawyers. It's now July 26, we're getting ready to start the conference, and people are gonna open up these books and they're gonna see a huge section missing. I mean, the page will just now naturally flip open to the Mike Lynn stuff that's missing. And they're gonna be, oh, that's kind of a, you know, not normal black hat quality. And then they're gonna look at the CD and it's gonna be this blank silver CD with like a sticker on it. And they're gonna wonder what's going on. So I'm gonna have to tell the attendees something. Um, it's affected the quality of my materials, and I'm not going to let Cisco or ISS uh, you know, try to impact the experience. So I'm going to have to tell people something's going on. So do you make a statement to the attendees? Of course you do. You have to. Um, but it would be nice if the statement to the attendees kind of uh, matched what Cisco and ISS was going to say. So I'm on the conference call. We literally have about 14 attorneys on the call. It's all done. The TRO is complete. Um, the materials have been handed over to uh, Mike Cottle, the master CDs, everybody's been notified. And I say to the attorneys, okay, that's great. The show starts, uh, I hand out books in 45 minutes. We have international press, like 35 international press. The conference hasn't started and this is the biggest story yet. It's buzzing. You know, what are you guys gonna say? I'm gonna tell them the truth. What are you guys gonna say? And the attorney is like, there's this little pregnant pause on the phone and the attorneys are like, 
ooh, that's marketing's problem, isn't it? No, 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 I think that's PR. Um, no, I think, well, 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 the agreement's complete, right? Yep, okay, bye. Click, 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 do -do 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 -do. And they all, they all log out. It's okay. I have to tell them something. So now I start getting pressure, um, now that they've gotten the materials pulled, I start getting pressure to have Mike cancel his speaking slot entirely. Now that his materials are not there, they just don't want Mike to speak at all. Um, so, do you give up Mike's speaking slot? Yes or no? There's no materials left. You've already got a temporary restraining order against you. Do you give it up? Yes or no? Yes? No. Right. No, you don't give it up. Because it's not ISS or Cisco's slot to give up. It's Mike's slot. And if Mike wants to present something else, I'll let him. So if he wants to, he has a backup presentation on voice over IP. If he wants to present that, that's the least I can do for all the trouble he's gone through. So, sure, Mike can, can present. So, I'm next door at a presentation of my own. And all of a sudden, my cell phone just starts to do 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 All these phone calls start coming in and messages and pagers. And uh, apparently Mike's next door busting loose with his Cisco talk. <laughs> he gets in there and he walks in. The room is packed. Everybody wants to see it. And, uh, and he's like, hey, I'm going to give my, uh, my talk on voice over IP security. And everybody boos. Like a room of like 600 people boos. And half of them stand up and it's like this mass migration of 300 people trying to get out the doors. And he's like, well, how many people want me to do my original talk? And everybody's all like, woo! <laughs> Go, Mike. So Mike's like, oh, okay. Sorry, Jeff. And he gives his talk. <laughs> so Mike quits on stage, quits ISS on stage, and gives his original presentation. So would you stop him? Do you stop him on stage from delivering his talk? I mean, yeah. I mean, how, how do you even go about, even if you wanted to stop him, how would you do this? I mean, a giant hook? Would you like <laughs> turn off like the microphones? Do you have like a squad come in and get him? And what if he fights back? I mean, he might know some, he might know some kung fu. He's got a wireless mic. He could be giving the talk in the hallway. So, I mean, I don't think you can stop him once he gets going. And, uh, and I wouldn't want to stop him either. So, no, you let him do his deal. I mean, it's all, it's all his game now. So, to recap, we've got all these players, and now we've got Jennifer Granick, Mike's lawyer. Um, what else do we have? So, the swirling vortex of shit begins. The press goes absolutely crazy. ISS goes crazy, changing the story again. Now, the problem with ISS is um, they change their story three or four times. They never contemplated that Mike would ever do this. They never went up and told him, don't talk. They just assumed that he wouldn't. Nobody gave him a restraining order. Nobody told Mike, if you do this, we'll fire you. Everybody just assumed that Mike would not do his talk. And so when he quit ISS and got up on stage, ISS was just dumbfounded. They, had, they felt totally betrayed and didn't even see it come in. Um, and of course, we saw that Cisco was completely caught unprepared to deal with any of these disclosure issues. And now it's like a headline news type story. So, the disclosure issues, is it reasonable for Mike uh, to disclose? Was it reasonable? Um, did his quitting help or hurt him? And does this help or hurt the future, uh, help future presentations uh, at conferences such as this? And since I'm kind of running short on time, I'll go very quickly. Um, my opinion is that it was reasonable for Mike to disclose. Cisco knew about the bugs. ISS had worked with Cisco. They would patched all the vulnerable IOS. So there was no uh, vulnerability at the time. The weird thing is, by Mike quitting, he actually hurt himself. Because somebody uh, at ISS headquarters, who will remain nameless, called up the FBI and claimed theft of trade secrets. And sick the FBI on Mike while he was still in the middle of uh, the negotiations with Cisco and ISS lawyers over the, uh, his materials. Um, and there's a funny story there. I'm cleaning up after the conference. I'm in a room putting away some materials, and my cell phone rings. Hello, Jeff Moss. Yes. This is Special Agent Jones from the FBI. Let's go. How can I help you? <laughs> like, yes, uh, can you come to the front desk? We'd like to ask you some questions. 
well, I'm a little bit busy right now. Uh, maybe I can answer your questions over the phone. No, no, we think it would be best if you came to the front desk and asked us some questions, you know, answered some questions for us. Well, no, I'm really busy. It's not that I don't trust you. It's just that I'm, you know, I've got this conference to close up. Why don't you just ask me these questions over the phone? Now I'm like hiding behind the screen, right? Because <laughs> I don't know where they are. And, uh, and they said, no, no, it's just, you know, no big deal. Why don't you come out and talk to us? I said, well, um, maybe I should I have my attorneys there? And they said, oh, you mean Jennifer Granick or Jeff McNamara? Yes, they can come if you'd like. How did they know the names of you know, the attorneys? So like I'm speed dialing Jennifer, she's having dinner with her parents, and I'm getting my attorney there, and, and, uh, and the FBI agents are there, and they are investigating this theft of trade secrets thing. And um, so Jennifer Granick's representing Mike Lynn. She's like, is my client the target of an investigation? Is my client the target of a, what, an inquiry? Is there a arrest warrant out of my client? Is there a pending arrest warrant out against my client? She's grilling the FBI agents. We can't tell you that. We can't disclose. We don't know. We're just in the early stages of an investigation. And uh, so it goes back and forth. Mike had already left and flown home, but the FBI didn't know that. And then the FBI says, you know, we're here to gather all evidence. Give us the tape of the video recording of the presentation. And uh, I say, I, I can't do that. I've got it, but I can't give it to you. And the uh, FBI doesn't like being told no. Um, but I couldn't. I said, well, you know, this federal judge that told me I can't give it to you, I have to give it to him. And the FBI is like, oh, yeah, you do what the federal judge says. That, yeah. <laughs> don't, don't anger the federal judge. And, uh, and they didn't know that this whole other thing was going on. And it turns out the guy at ISS on his own without informing legal just called the FBI on Mike. So um, some of the fallout. Just when you think it's over, it's all settled. Half the prospective buyers run away from the conference. They think there's a little too much risk involved in buying a conference business. Um, but two remaining people think it's really cool. And they're like, do you see how much press you're getting? This is great. And I'm like, and I'm like okay, I'm going to talk to you two guys. You know, you're the kind of company I want to be bought by. Um, the temporary restraining order becomes permanent. Um, because it's just a timeout issue. Now, what that basically means is we have to turn over all materials of Mike's uh, slides. So the stuff left in the office back home, um, all that has to be gotten rid of or sent back to Cisco. Um, I told you about ISS calling the FBI. And then we have this little problem with our web server leaking data. Um, so we're at DEF CON now, and everything's good. Problem solved. And I start getting a call from my attorney at like 7 in the morning saying that the material of Mike's stuff is still on the website. Cisco's driving right now to the uh, federal judge, to the courthouse, to like sue us for trillions of dollars for breach of this permanent restraining order because our, the, Mike's data is available online. I'm like, no, Mike's stuff's not online. I don't know how they got it. Somebody must have gotten the CD somewhere um, that was handed out, uh, got it early and passed it around. Well, it turns out that uh, our, our intrepid webmaster just removed the links but didn't delete his PowerPoint off the website. So you can look in your web server logs and you see people starting to guess, the pretty predictable names, you see people starting to guess at like that night. And for the next nine hours, people are trying to guess the file name of his materials. And at about five o'clock that morning, somebody gets it and it's like, you know, 200 okay. And then there's like this pause, like they can't believe it worked. And then there's like, then there's another one, okay. They're like, wow. And then about 30 seconds later, there's like five okays. And then about 10 minutes later, the website goes down because there's like thousands and thousands and thousands. Of <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so now the information's out. The slides are out there, and the problem becomes now post-disclosure. The, the data is out. Um, how do you clean up after a messy uh, disclosure? And not many people talk about trying to put the toothpaste back in the tube. I mean, how do you fix it? So basically, you either you make the problem irrelevant or you fix the problem. You know, Cisco had already released a new iOS version, so the a fundamental problem is fixed. Um, so the problem is basically irrelevant. But they also want the disclosed materials pulled in case somebody can learn something from them and find future vulnerabilities. So we have to pull, uh, remove all the existing physical and electronic material, uh, and they threaten to sue us for any further disclosure. Now, Cisco was fantastic to work with. Their lawyers were great. I mean, it was like dealing with real business people. You talk to them on the phone, you tell them you're going to do something, they would do what they said they were going to do, we would do what we were said we were going to do. Dealing with the ISS attorneys was a complete and utter nightmare. 
because the lead attorney was not an attorney. Um, he was an egomaniac. And, uh, and so he was the guy that ended up calling the FBI on Mike. And so we could talk sense with Cisco and say, hey, we deleted the PDF. You know, we still don't think our PDF is the one that got everywhere. We think it came from a CD. But um, this is us going to have to clean up the data leakage. Negative five minutes. OK, excellent. Third to last slide. So you can see the materials would come into us and it propagated to people's email spools, backups, CD masters, backup servers, it went to the press. We had to have um, letters from the court sent to the book publisher, the backup book, uh, the people that host all the publisher's materials, everything. This took like two weeks to satisfy everybody that we actually deleted the materials. That just came in on one email and it spread to this bit. Uh, very quickly. And I've never heard anybody really talk about uh, how to satisfy a post-disclosure. So that was my, that was a big insight. It took me over five months to get out from underneath it. I mean, it, to the, it was to the point where all the images of our laptops that were in the office, drive images, had to be forensically investigated and I got to pay for half of it to search for any words of Mike Lynn and see if we have spools in, in our spool files or uh, temp files, any of his materials that we may accidentally still have. Uh, it cost us about $200,000. People with power drills were drilling holes through our hard drives in the end to make sure that the data wasn't recoverable. Went straight through the, the hard drive into the attorney's desk and like left this big hole. <laughs> so the data destruction people hadn't really done this before. Um, but you know, the best part of this was the Wall Street Journal effect. Um, we got on the cover of the Wall Street Journal and the side effect is now my mom knows what I do. <laughs> because now all their friends are like, hey, isn't that your little boy Jeffrey's uh, conference? <laughs> and, uh, and it really helped kind of raise uh, the awareness. So would I do it again? Who here would go through it over again if you found yourself in a similar problem? Would you back out or would you fight? Um, I would do it over again. And I actually would do it uh, to a greater degree, I think. Not only is your reputation at stake, but you can't run a conference if you fold to this kind of pressure. Who's going to present? Everybody already sort of self-censors the material now, more now than they did, say, three years ago. Three years ago, the zero days were dropping. Now everybody's got censored blocks and scribbled out uh, notations. And it's already hard enough to pass on the information. If conference organizers start folding, then what's the point? I don't like it. Um, and in the press wasn't bad either, because the press always sees this as sort of a First Amendment right to free speech issue. So I don't think you're ever going to lose the press. They'll always be on your side, as long as you behave sort of responsibly. Um, so um, I zoomed through this a little bit because we started late. But I think if you look at the steps I took as this unfolded and ask yourself, was it reasonable? Would you have behaved in the same way? And if not, how would you have behaved differently? Um, not in some abstract, but in this concrete case. And you'll find that its uh, disclosure is a little bit more complicated than you think. Uh, I'll take any questions if I have time, or I'll take them at the break. Um, uh, since your email goes to slash that slash no, as we all know, yes. um, <clears throat> I will invite, uh, we are late, but I think that this is really interesting. So at least a couple of questions, does, we will make time for a couple of questions here and after at the break. Sure, you and I'll be around all day. So don't be shy. It's uh, your one in a lifetime occasion to interrogate Jeff Moss. He's usually behind the stage running everything, so yeah. uh, for one season, the stage. This is uh, when Dan and Mike and FX snuck into the Cisco party the following year. <laughs> OK, uh, questions? Oh, come on. Dave, you can ask questions to Jeff anytime. Ask no, no, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Jeff. Jeff, one question. Um, you started with, let's say, the legal part, where you basically have the presenter uh, signing some information that, okay, I have the, uh, the okay from my employer. Right. <laughs> Going to the story, um, at some point of time, it becomes clear that uh, apparently he doesn't have the approval from his employer. Yeah. So what makes you decide to still continue despite, let's say, the feedback from, from his employer saying we're not okay with the presentation? Yeah, so apparently it got vetted three times. And every time a change was made, the, the uh, ISS signed off on it and said it was okay. 
And it turns out what the problem was, it was that um, ISS was trying to do a deal with Cisco at the time. And ISS wanted to license secure, uh, security vulnerability information from Cisco, include it in their product, and claim that they're the only ones that had all the Cisco specific vulnerability knowledge. And Cisco was dangling this carrot saying, well, we'll do this deal with you if you pull Mike's materials. We'll do this deal with you if you don't let Mike speak. And, and I think ISS was trying to get both. They're trying to show off Mike because it was a really interesting talk, but they also wanted to appease Cisco. Um, so, you know, at the time we accepted his talk, there was approval. And we printed the materials and we can't expect, you know, pre, uh, we can't expect employers to change their mind on us, on and off. So at some point we just said they approved it at one point, we're sticking with that. Now if they don't want to approve it later, well, we'll argue about that. But, you know, legal did look at it, they did say it was okay. So, yeah. Because it was really Mike, Mike is the one, he developed it on ISS time and he got approval from ISS. Um, so they could tell him to quit or try to prevent him from speaking. I think that's the other reason why he quit. Let Dave, let Dave ask his question. Yeah. So how did that compare to the Apple event? The Apple event, yeah, the Apple event was a little bit more interesting because um, we knew there was a problem with the Apple event like the day of, there was no weird emails back and forth. It was uh, David saying, hey, you think I should let Apple know? I'm like, yeah, that would be a good idea. Um, <laughs> it's, hey, you're giving your talk tomorrow. And so luckily it was the Worldwide Wireless Developers Conference the day of Black Hat and we had the number of the lead guy at Apple. And so we just put them on the phone together and the Apple response was, oh, well that's not in our driver, not a big deal, we'll fix it later, thanks for letting us know. And then when Apple PR heard about it and it kind of got out of hand, then all of a sudden it was a big deal for Apple. But since, um, since at the time there was no threats, it was not a big deal. Afterward, it, kind of, it was kind of a nightmare. <laughs> Afterward. Um, what we did with Mike Lynn is, because we knew there was gonna be trouble, we had somebody sit down and get a private um, presentation of Mike Lynn. Step through everything, ask him questions, see everything. He showed us everything, so we knew it wasn't just like a mocked up fake thing. We knew there was some real magic there. Uh, and so we tried to do the same thing with uh, David Mainers, because any time we detect that there might be a little drama, we want to get full access to everything, review everything, and have it demonstrated in front of us, because we don't want to be accused of you know, letting some voodoo occur on stage. That's about the best you can do. If somebody really wants to pull wool over your eyes, they can probably do it, but they'll ruin their reputation. Mike, on the other hand, got a great reputation over this. I was talking to him immediately afterward, and he had his hands full of business cards, and he's like, lawsuit, lawsuit, job offer, press, job offer, job offer, press. And he's been doing, he's done fine. Um, he told me that, you know, I said, why did you really do it? And he's like, well, you know, I'm really young. I don't owe any money on anything. I'm not married. I don't have kids. I can afford to do this once in my life. So <laughs> it's like I decided to do it. It's like, okay, that makes sense. Honest answer. Any other questions? Do you have the video of the ripping? Oh, I got the video of the ripping <laughs> here, yeah. Yeah. So this is another interesting story in that uh, to cover my ass, I uh, had an employee video record the uh, book ripping. And uh, he thinks it would be really good to you know, share that video with someone just in case. And that person thought it would be good to share that video online just in case. <laughs> so I'm sitting here talking to Cisco trying to play nice. Um, Everything's fine, no, no, uh, you know, sorry about leaking that PDF online. Oh, and the video of all of your employees ripping out the stuff that's all over the net on <laughs> Yeah, no, that was unintentional too. It just, <laughs> yeah. So out of control employees sometimes can make your life very complicated. You know. So uh, let me see if this will this will render. I don't know if I have the right player for it. Okay. Um, so but I'll show are, it off later. Yeah. No, no. Uh, you you can uh, you can play it. I just wanted to uh, to say that since we are running a little late. Uh, we will be shifting 
of 10 of 10 minutes the next slot so the next slot will end at 10 50 and we will cut short the coffee break sorry for that it already happened and it will happen at every conference you will attend uh um, so uh basically oh, I, that's i, I did want to point out one thing though um if you do have to get sued by a company prefer to get sued by cisco over iss because <laughs> it's a much better company to get sued by Okay, let's see. Question. Oh, yes. Um, what is surprising me is that neither Cisco nor ISS was precipitating what would happen if the um, materials are missing. Yeah. Because that is even more news than the talk. <laughs> the talk is concrete, it's giving concrete vulnerabilities. Canceling this talk or canceling the material it brings for superstition that makes the event bigger. It makes it than that it's... much worse. Yeah. And they did not, th that was the interesting thing. They, nobody had thought it through. It was a right hand, left hand problem. The lawyers learned that it's a problem, so the lawyers do what lawyers do. And nobody further up the food chain could see that there was going to be an issue. Um, when there's that much press there, I mean, they're going to make something of it. And nobody contemplated any of it. And it's so funny because afterwards, when you talk, to, well, you talk to Cisco because they're nice. The ISS people don't want to talk to you, but. <laughs> The Cisco guys, you know, afterward, I, I went up to Mike when this was all over, Mike Cottle, and I'm like, you know, you could have just called me. Just pick up the phone and say, hey, there's this problem. You know, we really want to make sure these materials aren't produced because um, we might have to sue you. Or something, give me a heads up. I said, if it was that big of a problem, call me. And he's like, well, you know, in hindsight, I should have called you. But um, ISS told me it was all taken care of. And so their lesson is don't believe ISS or another partner, you know, make the call themselves. Don't, don't believe somebody else is doing it for them. Um, yeah, sucks. Okay, so this is a, uh, a video of, I have two videos, let's see. One is the guy power drilling through the desk, uh, and one is uh, ripping the materials. Let's see. What's, a, what's the file association with, what is it here? I'll take a, one more question while I'm trying to get this uh, video to render. MOV, that's a quick time thing, right? Somebody's got to have a question. I have one. Okay. Do you think that, I mean, we, we see, uh, we see where weird things being released at Black Hat every year. Uh, do you think that anybody would have noticed Michael, Mike Slim's presentation if there was no issue or surrounding it? I mean, if they didn't pull it from the book, if they didn't threaten you, if they didn't sue you, uh, I, I don't think actually everybody, anybody would have noticed that Mike's presentation was so, so special. You don't think anybody would have cared? Uh, no, not really. I, I mean, there, there will be a couple of, you know, follow-ups on the usual mailing list and the usual blogs afterwards, and that will be it. Uh, uh, I think, well, so two things. Nobody had done that before with iOS. No, no, I, I'm, I'm not saying it was not novel. But oh, I'm but you mean, would it have been Wall Street would Journal? Have it would be, not have been Wall Street Journal. Yeah. No. The general public would not have noticed. Yeah, I mean. they patched it and they would have said, problem's already fixed, no big deal. Yeah, they really shot themselves in the foot. It was great for me, um, <laughs> in hindsight. And if I did, the, I did the math at one point, how much it would have cost me to buy that amount of press versus <laughs> the amount of press that was free. And I think our PR person did the analysis, and there's one negative article, there was about 32 neutral articles, and there's over 300 positive articles in our favor. And we figured that was probably half a million dollars in free press, and the lawsuit was only a little over 200, so it was sort of a net gain. Um, but it was really stressful, so I don't know how to value stress. But there's some cost involved there. Well, it's not playing because I don't have the sound driver loaded, so I'll just show it later on this afternoon. Okay, great. Thank you very much, though. Thank you very much, Jeff. I'll answer any questions you have later.